Jay Servi here with realagriculture.com and we're at the Farming Smarter 2019 conference here in Lethbridge, Alberta and I'm joined by Ken Coles, a good friend of the site. All right, so today, Ken, you talked about some of the results of a precision planting study that you guys did. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Sure, so this is a study now that is in the fourth year on canola. And we originally started off because we bought a planter to study dryland grain corn and then saw that farmers were already interested in using their, their planters for, for canola. So we thought this was a, a really good opportunity to dig into it a little bit more and, and, and learn whether there's advantages, disadvantages, and, and find out, you know, is this a practical uh, new step for, for, say, planting canola. So it's been a fun, uh, interesting study. We did this on irrigation and on dry land at three locations a year uh, for, for four years now. So um, this year also, we had a new project funded through the CAP program in the Alberta government where we thought, well, okay, we've, we've now done canola. If, if, if it's working and folks are buying planters, now they started asking questions, what about other crops? So we, we were able to play around with wheat, uh, a lot of the pulses, peas, chickpeas, lentils, faba beans, soybeans, and, and hemp. So, so now we've got one year under our belt with all these other small grains crops. And Louis uh, Barta, our precision ag specialist, has also taken our canola study to uh, our field tested program. And basically what that means is we're trying to say, learn what we, or take what we've learned in the small plot scenario and do some field scale studies because then there's always another uh, layer of information and, and lots of more variability and different types of equipment. Find out whether that translates into the real world scenario. All right, so what are the, some of the results that you found? So on the canola study, we, we looked at both seeding rates and we compared an air drill. And in our case, we had pillar laser openers on a 12 inch row spacing. We compared that to a planter, a monosem planter, also on 12 inch row spacing. So that's something that's a little unique to our project. Most planters, most planters are usually configured on a wider row spacing, like say 22 inch row spacing for beans or sugar beets, or, or even wider 30 inches for, for corn. Um, we felt that the wide row spacing probably doesn't work in our environment because we have really short growing seasons and we need the, the canopy closure. Plus a lot of the previous work and most of our crops has shown that that a narrow row spacing and that say 10 to 12 inch row spacing is ideal. So we felt like we got to include that. And we also did the monosem on a 20 inch row spacing, kind of mimicking what a lot of farmers were doing in the meantime. So the big results that we found is that we definitely are getting better emergence with the planter. It just does a really nice job with seed to soil contact. It has really good depth control. Uh, and then the precise uh, metering of the seed where it singulates individual seeds as opposed to say just letting it pour out on a on a, an air air seeder or a drill that emergence is, is by far um, and, and statistically better with the planter. Now when we look at the yield it's it's a little bit more variable and what we did find is that it really depends on the soil conditions and and the, the weather throughout the growing season too. So we just have so many different types of environment that we grow under here that it, it ends up being pretty tough to sort out, you know, is there a rule of thumb? And no, there isn't. Like, um, for the most part though, what we did find is in dry land when we didn't have the yield potential, there was no yield advantage to the planter compared to the air drill. So that's, you know, neither good nor bad, but it isn't, it isn't a bad thing. So at least you're not um, creating a, uh, a, a poorer environment, so so it, it can definitely, I, I guess, measure up to the air drills that are being used out there. But we did find a reduction in yield with the 20 inch row spacing compared to both the air drill and the planter on uh, on a narrower row. So that's not super surprising, but you know, at the same time, uh, a lot of folks are out there using the wider row spacing, um, and and they're being. And they're doing that, they're justifying that by lower seed rates. So, well, I'm gonna save some money on seed rates, but at the same time, I think there's probably some yield sacrifice, and that's not necessarily a good thing either. The downside is, is that, you know, planters don't really exist at this point on narrow rows. They can be designed that way. There's still a lot of ways to go as far as equipment manufacturing is concerned, trying to adapt planters to more of a small grains type scenario. So I think we'll see that. I think there's, from what I'm hearing in the industry, there are companies that are working towards that. So that's good news. Um, on the high, uh, high production zones, the irrigated sites, 
we, when we did see an advantage, it was significant. So in the good years, we were seeing as high as a 20% yield advantage for the planter versus the air drill. So that's, that's huge. And, and, and that would translate to a, a really big economic advantage. We only saw that three out of eight site years. Um, and any other site year, um, it was at least equal to uh, the air drill. So again, when we're running statistics on the trials, there's a lot of variability. So if you don't have a perfectly clean study, you can't you know, legitimately say this was better. But um, visually, it was striking. I, I, I just loved looking at the plots. They were always prettier than the air drill. They were so much more uniform. And, and then that started making me think about what are the opportunities for better agronomy? So a, a nice even crop, now that allows me to say, do a better job with my herbicide timing or with cereals, fungicide timing, or growth regulator timing. And, and can we manage tillers and things like that? Do that really advanced agronomy stuff with a much more even crop. And really the jury's still out on that. So that'll be what we focus on in the next couple of years, along with the field scale, uh, field tested application of the canola on, on farms. Awesome, so great results. So you're only a year into um, your studies with in regard wheat. to other crops. Yep. yep. Are you seeing anything? Well, um, these were all dry land. Well, the, sorry, the pulse crops were all dry land and just striking differences uh, on emergence. So way better, more even emergence. Uh, because of the drought conditions, we didn't see any yield difference. So um, nothing to say on that front yet, but I'm excited to find out what it looks like under a good year. As far as the irrigated Durham study, uh, again, improved emergence, but we can't say that we saw any improvement in yield. What we did see was that the yield ranged from about 95 to 120 bushels. And again, it, it wasn't statistically significant. So as a scientist, we can't get excited and say, we don't have any confidence in the results. So it's gonna take more site years, but I think that there is an opportunity to expand and push yield boundaries with planters. Awesome. So Southern Alberta centric study? Yeah, we're, we're focused in Southern Alberta. Uh, if there's ever an opportunity to expand by partnering with other groups, then we would look at that for sure. Awesome, thanks a lot, Ken. Thanks.